Okay, let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2 again. Hebrews chapter 2. And we're at verse 9 in Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> let's read verses 9 through 13. Although I, I know we're not going to get through all of these five verses today, but let's, or four verses today, let's read them anyway. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Stop there. Verse 9 is profound. It says, but we see Jesus. You know, that's all you need to see. Christ said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, in John chapter 3. Uh, the Greeks told Philip, John 12, verse 21, sir we would see Jesus. It says, who was made a little lower than the angels. Just as man, or Adam, was said to have been made a little lower than the angels, up there in verse 7, which we looked at last week. Then in some ways, Christ was made like Adam, which is why he is compared with Adam as the head of a certain race of people. Go, if you will, back to the book of Romans and chapter 5. Romans 5. And I'll call your attention to a few verses there. Notice Romans 5. And verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man, that would be Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. It didn't say just a few sinned, and the others were pretty good. It says death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 3.23 says, For um, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Look there at verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. And verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more, excuse me, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So Adam and Jesus Christ were said to have been the um, forebears, the, the standard bearers of a certain race of men on the earth. Also verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So both Adam and Christ, are com they're compared with each other because both represent some new role, some new leading leader of the human race. Adam, the race of men in the flesh. Christ, the race of saints now who have been regenerated uh, by the work of God, and one day their flesh is going to be changed to be glorified like Christ. 
And so he's compared to man. He's compared to Adam here in Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, let's continue back at verse 9 in our text. He says, for the suffering of death. So he was made like a man because men die. That's Adam's legacy to men. We're all going to die. The Bible says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 verse 8. Uh, it says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself uh, a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 1 Timothy 2 verses 5 and 6. And so Christ died and was buried and rose again. And now, verse 9 says, crowned with glory and honor. He has not yet received the crown uh, of, of glory over this earth as king of kings, or as, um, quote, king over all the earth, as Zechariah 14, verse 9 puts it. But he most certainly will receive that crown when he returns in glory, according to Matthew 25. In fact, let's run over there. We've got time. Matthew chapter 25. If you consider the time frame, Matthew 25 takes place. Chapter 24, Christ described the, the tribulation as such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time no, nor ever shall be. I think I talked about that last Sunday in our sermon. And then after the tribulation, verse uh, chapter 25, we'll pick up there verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be <coughs> gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Uh, someone pointed out to me years ago that a baby lamb or sheep and a baby goat almost look identical to each other when they're young. Um, the goats have no horns that have formed on their heads yet. Their, the consistency of their fur is pretty much the same, or their wool. Their, well, see, lambs produce wool, goats produce... Um, no, what are their... Cashmere. Cashmere, right. Cashmere, <clears throat> I guess cashmere socks are expensive. That's why I don't have any. But, um, but they resemble one another. But as time goes on, both of them begin to exhibit the traits with which they were born, the genetics that makes them different from one another. But they resemble each other at first. And so Christ will separate the sheep from the goats and says he will sit upon the throne of his glory. And it says uh, all nations will be gathered uh, to him. For judgment. <clears throat> but he has not yet received that authority yet. He'll sit down upon the throne of King David uh, in a physical, literal, earthly, actual city of Jerusalem here on this earth. Go back, if you will, to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 14. Jeremiah 14, let's read verses 18 through 21. Jeremiah 14, verses 18 through 21. If I go forth into the field, then behold the slain with the sword. And if I enter into the city, then behold them that are sick with famine. Yea, both the prophet and the priest go about into a land that they know not. Hast thou utterly rejected Judah? Hath thy soul loathed Zion? Why hast thou smitten us, and there is no healing for us? We looked for peace, and there is no good, and for the time of healing, and behold, trouble. We acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. How often is that scenario, that sequence of events played out in the history of the Jews, driven from 
from their land taken captive. You know, and they turn and repent, and God says, if you repent and pray towards this place, and I'll have pity on you, I'll forgive your sin and restore you once again. That's happened repeatedly, and it's going to happen again. Uh, they think it won't happen now because they're living safe in the modern state of Israel, but it's going to happen again when the man of sin appears. Verse 21, Do not abhor us for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember, break not thy covenant with us. But run forward to Jeremiah 22. <coughs> Excuse me. Jeremiah 22. And verses 29 and 30. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. But go forward to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And verses 31 and 32, or rather verses 32 and 33, excuse me. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. There's no king ruling over Israel or over the, the Jews around the world at the moment. But there is coming one who is a rightful heir to the throne, who will sit upon the throne of King David and rule over Israel once again, and by extension, the entire world, over all nations of the world. And J.R. Tolkien couldn't have made it any uh, plainer in The Return of the King if the uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy. But um, lastly, verse 9 uh, in our text today says that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He didn't just taste death. He marked this one down as a, as a good reference when you're dealing with Calvinism. He didn't just taste death for the elect in John Calvin's system, only for those who God had chosen in eternity past to save, what they call God's eternal decrees. Uh, not just the elect, not just those who God had chosen to save. Uh, in Calvinism, God has uh, uh, made two eternal, unchangeable decrees. Long before he ever created the world, long before the heaven and the earth appeared, he decided he was going to create a race of men, and he decided which ones he would save, and he decided which ones he would not save. He decided, he deliberately decided to save these, and he deliberately declared that he will damn these others. Those are his two decrees. I'm going to save these, I'm going to damn those others. And so that when men were finally born and came into the world, they had no choice. They had no free will. There was nothing they could do or say or, or, or act upon that would change God's decision which had already been made. And this is not, this is not Bible study, this is just philosophy. Calvinism is nothing but a philosophical um, train of, uh, line of thinking that has nothing to do with studying verse by verse and comparing scripture with scripture. They say that every man here, the Calvinist, will try to say, well, he means by that the elect. Everyone that was elect, God uh, died for. But uh, not so. Look at verses 6 and 7 here in Hebrews 2. <clears throat> but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, 
Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. The context is all men. The context is the entire human race, uh, beginning with Adam, or signified, represented by Adam, and carrying on into all men. Verse 10 in our text says, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. Now that reference there is a reference to the elect, the many, out of uh, the, the every man. The many who turn to Christ out of every man for whom Christ died. Not every man in the world is a saved child of God, or every woman, if you ladies feel slighted by my, my language. But many sons do come to glory because many do trust in Christ as the captain of their salvation, as he says later in the verse. Elect is a title, it's a designation uh, of the one who has already been born again. It is not an explanation of how he came to be born again. Amen. Elect is a title which is conferred upon you the moment you trust in the Lord Jesus to be your Savior. You are now considered one of the elect. Um, and God, you're not one of the select. You are one of the elect. Um, it's been said that uh, before a man can get elected, he has to be a candidate. And if you are, you become a candidate to by, by simply trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ for your sake, admitting that you're a sinner uh, and understanding that your goodness, no good deed on your part can ever affect salvation or, or bring about your entry into heaven or open the doors of heaven for you. Uh, you can trust only in the work of Jesus Christ for your, on your behalf. Once you do that, you are now elected. You are the elect. And let me say that, as I said it earlier, elect is a title for one who has already been born again. It is not an explanation of how the man became born again. Then in the end of verse 10, it says, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So that means that in the Bible, clearly the word perfect doesn't mean sinless. You might mark that down as a reference whenever someone asks, well, what does it mean to be perfect? In the Bible, the word perfect doesn't mean simply sinless. You say, well, wasn't Christ sinless? And the answer is yes. Christ was sinless, but he wasn't yet made perfect. The only way he could be made perfect was through suffering. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. That's over a page or so. Hebrews chapter 5. Look there at verses... 8 and 9. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So the word perfect obviously means complete. It doesn't simply mean sinless. It means complete. Uh, Jesus Christ actually had to learn something after he was already sinless. And he was made perfect after he was already sinless. Uh, there's a question that might be asked. Um, what could he possibly learn? Doesn't God already know everything? Isn't he omniscient? He certainly is. Wasn't the Lord Jesus Christ God manifest in the flesh? 1 Timothy 3.16 Yes, he certainly was and is. So what could he possibly learn? Um, yet the, te the text says, yet learned he obedience. And you might think he already knew that. He, he told the Father later in uh, Hebrews 10, verse 9, I come to do thy will, O God. So yes, he understood obedience, but he hadn't experienced it as a man. 
This is the fine, the distinction, the clear distinction that needs to be made. He hadn't experienced it as a man. There's a great gap in having a theoretical understanding of something and actually living through it in real life, living through it in reality. Uh, you can have a lot of book knowledge without uh, any practical experience in the subject. And uh, there are some companies, there are some employers who understand this distinction. They will prefer someone who has 15 years of actual on-the-job experience in that field over someone who simply majored it in college, majored in it in college, but has never really worked in that field, in that, in, in that uh, line of work. Um, the idea that, it's the old, it's the old, old conundrum, um, you can't get a job unless you have experience, but you can't get the experience unless you have a job. It's a sort of a catch-22. But go, if you will, to, um, well, let's see. Go, if you will, back to Zechariah chapter 3. Near the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 3. And look at two verses there, verses 1 and 2. Zechariah 3, verses 1 and 2. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? By the way, notice that language of verse 2. The Lord said, the Lord rebuke thee. That's like the Lord bring fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah. How can that be? Well, with the doctrine of the Trinity, or rather at least the, the doctrine of the triune Godhead, it can be. When someone rejects the Trinity, they have to abandon, they have to reject multiple verses throughout the Bible that would require a Trinitarian understanding for the verse to make any sense. Yep. And by the way, also notice in uh, verse 2, and the Lord, notice capitals, L-O-R-D, that is usually the word Jehovah, translated into English, said unto Satan, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, rebuke thee, O Satan. That means that Jesus Christ is the same as Jehovah. And the Heavenly Father is Jehovah. So we don't worship three gods or some three-headed uh, idol like Jehovah's Witnesses want to accuse us of. We worship the Lord God of the Bible who has revealed himself in three persons. We don't worship three gods. We worship one God who has... Now, do we fully comprehend all of it? I don't know anybody that can fully comprehend it. But it doesn't mean we can't embrace it and believe it. But Zechariah 3, verse 2, and uh, now go forward to the book of Luke, chapter 4. Luke, chapter 4, And I'm going to read from verses 1 down to verse 13. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. I bet he did. And the devil said unto him, if thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, 
showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of him, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, excuse me, to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Satan knew how difficult it was for men to say no to temptations, and so he waited till Jesus had been fasting uh, and praying for 40 days, having eaten nothing, and he knew how weak his physical uh, body would be at that time. You can imagine not having eaten for 40 days when you're used to eating about every four hours in America. And so you can imagine how weak the body of Christ must have been after that ordeal outdoors in the wilderness for 40 days. When Christ, when Christ found the disciples asleep in Gethsemane, he said to them, The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, verse 41. And the flesh indeed is weak. But alone in the wilderness, notice he didn't declare, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, in some eloquent uh, response. But he said, get thee behind me, in a, a reply of anguish. He was experiencing uh, the sufferings of man firsthand. He was learning and becoming patient, rather, and becoming perfect in the Bible sense of those terms. Colossians 2.15 tells us, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Christ made a fool out of Satan because he was able to live a life of a mortal man, of flesh and blood, and never yield to temptation. He never succumbed to the enticements of the flesh offered by Satan. And, as I say, he was learning and becoming perfect in the Bible's definition of those two words. Um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was victorious over sin. You know, and I've mentioned this before, uh, some have postulated and, and proposed that Christ as the Son of God was incapable of sin because he was perfect. And uh, you and I must reject that thinking. Because if he was incapable of sin, then he wasn't victorious over anything. He didn't have to. There's no way that temptation of Satan could have had any appeal to his flesh. And Satan would have known that if Christ was incapable. But he had to have been capable. Otherwise, he can't identify with the problems that you go through. If you approach God and you want to complain against God as all skeptics want to do, as all atheists want to do, as all doubters, and anyone who's not interested in um, knowing God or knowing the scriptures, if you want to accuse God of saying, what does he know about the problems I go through? How can he identify with my life and the trials and the struggles I wrestle with and contend with day after day if he's never gone through anything? But 
through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, uh, who triumphed over principalities and powers uh, and, and made a show of them openly, he can say now, I understand. I know what you're going through. I know what it's like to be spat upon. I know what it's like to be cold. I know what it's like to be stripped naked. I know what it's like to be beaten. I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to be thirsty. I know what it's like to cry and shed tears and, and then to be put to death out of hatred. I know what it's like for people to be jealous of me uh, like the, like the uh, chief priests were. I know what it's like for people to betray me like Judas did. I know what it's like for my closest friends to turn their backs on me and, and uh, go in the opposite direction. He knows all of those things. And uh, don't you think, you say, well, he's never gone down to the boulevard and been enticed by some streetwalker. How do you know that? How do you know that? Some of those women that turned to Christ were harlots. And it's very easy for modern man to take advantage of someone like that rather than, rather than uh, preach Christ to someone like that. You want to dismiss them as the outcasts of society and, and they're just worthless human beings and they're, un, they're unredeemable. And, uh, and the, the flesh of men is very corrupt. You hear guys talk about um, street walkers and fornication all the time in the workplace, as if it's just something every, everybody does and accepts. It's not. But uh, the idea that, that Christ wasn't um, approached even with that possible temptation. The Bible doesn't describe everything for us. The Bible doesn't tell us every detail. John says at the end of his gospel, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life uh, through his name. But he doesn't tell us everything that that Christ did, everything that happened in his life. He said, if so, uh, even the world couldn't contain the books that should be written. And so you don't know, but, but Paul writes he was tempted at all points, like as we are. Do you realize uh, when Satan tempted the woman in the garden, uh, he appealed to her flesh, the flesh of the, the tree of the fruit of the fruit of the tree was pleasant to the eyes, a uh, tree de desired to make one wise. He appealed to her pride, and he said, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You take that fruit. So he appealed to those elements, and those elements were undoubtedly offered to Jesus Christ. I'll give you all these kingdoms, and all these kingdoms will bow down to you right now. All you have to do is bow down to me first. And he says, command these stones to be made bread. You're hungry? Use the powers you have. And, uh, but to do so, he would be following Satan's recommendation. And he knew better than to do that. And uh, cast yourself off the pinnacle of the temple. You won't get hurt. The Bible prophesies that the angels will take thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. You won't get hurt. You won't get harmed. Uh, Test God. Put him to the test. He says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. To tempt means to test someone. To provoke them to, to, to action to see if they'll respond the way you, you think they'll respond. But um, Christ was victorious in temptations in, in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And so through Christ, God the Father can say, I understand. I know what you're going through. It's no longer just a, a concept with the divine trinity in the unseen world. It is now practical knowledge gained through the obedience of Jesus Christ.